Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents, a new offering on Village TV. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization committed to peace, social justice, economic equality, and a clean environment. For the duration of the lockdown, instead of its usual two meetings a month, Concerned Citizens will broadcast two programs a month on this channel. Our programs will feature films, lectures, and debates on topics related to our mission. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Present. My name is Suzanne Modell, and I chair the committee that plans these broadcasts. Today's program will be shown in February, which is Black History Month. Concerned Citizens is sensitive to the plight of ethnic and racial minorities 12 months of the year, but during the month of February, it has traditionally devoted its programming to the challenges facing the African-American community. Given the ongoing mistreatment that African Americans suffer at the hands of the police. This month, Concerned Citizens has asked retired detective Debbie Ramsey to tell, help us understand this intractable problem. Ms. Ramsey served 12 years on the Baltimore police force. She has been a member of several federal task forces, the co-host of a radio program, and an Open Society Fellow. Currently, Ms. Ramsey is the founder and executive director of Out of School Time, a violence prevention program for Baltimore youth. We received Ms. Ramsey's name from the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, a group of criminal justice professionals working to make our legal system more ethical and more equitable. Detective Ramsey, to begin, I would like you to tell us something about your background. Please share whatever details about your past and your present you'd like to discuss. First and foremost, thank you, Suzanne. I really appreciate it. I'm humbled to be here to discuss with you uh, how we as a society can help one another. Uh, yes, I am Deborah Ramsey. I am the current executive director and founder of Unified Effort. It is a nonprofit organization here in Baltimore, Maryland, that we provide free out of school time programs for young people, K through 24. My background, um, I, I pretty much have a checkered past <laughs> um, as, as I will get into born in Baltimore, however, raised in the South in North Carolina during my formative years. So I claim dual citizenship. Uh, when I am back in North Carolina, I say I'm from Baltimore. When I'm here in Baltimore, I'm from North Carolina. <laughs> so it was that combination of having both cultures that pretty much um, helped to design who I am. And I say that as a baby boomer. Um, during my formative years raised in the South in a small town in, in North Carolina called Roxborough, it was during the Jim Crow and the desegregation of um, public spaces. So I got, as a young child, I got a glimpse of how um, that felt, um, genuinely felt without being filtered through the um, words or the emotions of others. I was at the age of um, seven when we moved to North Carolina. So I had a, um, a broad sense of what diversity looked like. Um, prior to moving to North Carolina, we lived in a very small street on the east side of Baltimore. Anyone from Baltimore know there is a distinction between East Baltimore and West Baltimore. My dad worked at a steel mill for 40 some years. And so there I saw a lot of diversity. I saw black, white, the, um, the, the deli person who was right next door to us and police officers and Fire, firefighters who were black and white. Even though I did go to a predominantly black school in, in Baltimore, but yet I had a sense of community because my parents, they navigated between both spaces and there was never any distinction. And I never heard any of my parents say anything negative one way or the other. So coming to North Carolina, there was a line drawn in the sand and it didn't feel comfortable to me. And I knew straight away that once I graduated from high school, I was getting out of there. And, but before I did that, 
one of the things that um, that stands out to me the most of how I was able to uh, maintain my sense of balance um, navigating through both spaces was that as I came of age in high school, um, I had an opportunity to help desegregate the high school. And I did that without giving it a second thought. It just felt it felt um, natural to me. So I'm glad I gave myself that gift of coming of age with people who do not look like me. We were on projects together. We studied together. We went to the prom together. And so I got a sense of um, uh, whites, my age, that we were all we were all the same. There was no distinction. And I felt very comfortable and, and never had a negative experience because I wasn't anticipating anything negative. And so that was one of the things that stand out to me that I was one of the first to desegregate our high school. And the other thing is, um, as we celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day on yesterday, I remember the night that he was assassinated. And what I was doing that very night when I came home and my mom told me what had happened, I just came from um, canvassing, which we did, um, getting people in rural North Carolina to vote. So um, as something as tragic as that happened, I have a memory of I was doing something positive and to, um, to enhance um, us as a society that the night that such a peaceful person was assassinated, I was about, as a young person, helping people to register to vote to make a better society. So I hope that gives you an idea of who I am and how I was able to join a police department that was predominantly white male and for me to feel comfortable. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Thank you. So you've been you've been a crusader, a baby boomer crusader. <laughs> uh, I would I would say perhaps uh, we are highly sympathetic as a group of baby boomers ourselves. Yeah. Indeed. Now, I would like to remind our viewers that police violence is not a problem that white Americans just discovered. Hmm. In March, believe it or not, it will be 30 years since the police savagely beat Rodney King, an event that was recorded by cell phone. Nevertheless, the police were acquitted for it. Ever since that outrage, cell phones have captured countless deadly encounters between blacks and police, but the statistics have not declined. Looking cross-nationally in 2019, controlling for population size, the U.S. leads the world in police killings. Canada ranks seven, second, but its police kill one third as often as American police. In most developed countries, death at the hands of the police is about 1 20th the rate in the United States. Still, after this summer's BLM protests, victims lodged thousands of complaints of police brutality. In short, police violence is common and it's continuing. So I've decided to ask Detective Ramsey to devote most of the time we have together to the question, why have so many attempts to remedy this situation failed? And I'd like to start by asking about diversifying the police force. That was one of the earliest proposals for change. I understand that currently about 45% of the city of Baltimore's police is black. The police commissioner for Baltimore City is also black. So, Detective Ramsey, can you talk to us about the value of having blacks enforce the law? And then, if you can, provide some reasons why black representation does not seem to have made as much difference as people hoped. Thank you for that um, in-depth question that needs to be asked and is very, um, it's not complicated to me at all, it's very simple. Um, when I joined the police department, it was because the community wanted their police department to look like itself, to be representative of itself. So the community put forth a campaign and made a concerted effort for their voices to be heard. 
Baltimore, Maryland has always been predominantly black. It's not a new phenomenon. Um, if you look at it um, strategically where it's located, near one of the largest ports in the United States, and I think it's the only one that's further west, so which means it gets a lot of business. Um, blacks migrated from the South, along with my father, who came from the South to get employment, to raise his seven kids. My mom never worked outside the home, so we had fantastic <laughs> health insurance and, and all of that that came along with that. However, when you have a police department that does not look like the community, in my estimation, that is a recipe for, for potential, not necessarily a guarantee, a potential for mistrust, misunderstandings, mistreatment. I was also a detective in our internal investigation division, which means that I investigated police officers who were charged formally with um, wrongdoings, um, criminal activities, and all of that. So to answer your question, um, we can have a department that has such powers as the authority to uh, deter someone's uh, ability movement uh, and arrest and detain. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of authority. Now, imagine someone having that authority that has, that's misguided, that is prejudiced, that has deep-rooted biases. And so you have the kind of authority so if you look at someone like me, if you have a deep-seated bias against people who look like me and you have that kind of authority, what are you going to do? Would you give me the benefit of the doubt if you saw me in my vehicle on the side of the highway and I'm sitting in my car as opposed to thinking that you need to come out with, with guns drawn? Or would you think, wow, maybe she's sick, or maybe she needs help? So you have a, a, you, you have a uh, situation that is doomed. And so in the training, we had six months of training in the academy, and we were given several batteries of psychological testing. And if you pass the physical, the defensive, and, and all of those other, but there's not a test for deep-rooted racism and biases and prejudice. How do you, how, what does that look like? What does that look like? And it crosses all um, it crosses all boundaries. You can be black and have deep rooted biases. You can be white and have deep rooted biases and prejudice, and uh, and just be totally misguided. So that goes both ways. So there's no test for that. And the only um, cursory test, or uh, what I call like a surface test, is to at least have the department resemble the community. Baltimore currently is seventy percent black right now today with a police department is 45 percent uh black uh, not unless you are um certain about the officers is not looking like the community are sympathetic and empathetic and and does not possess any deep-rooted biases or prejudices how wh wh what do you think what do you think is going to happen so i have always been of the mindset that the department should uh, resemble the community that is served. So at least on the surface, you have a um, you you have an agency that has so much power. It's not like it's not like you're working for the Department of Public Works or even the fire department. The police department, law enforcement, is very very unique. What other agency can you think of that has that type of power without screening people? to ensure the safety and the trust of the community. So it's just a given. Basically, for me, join the police department, as I indicated before, you pass the, the psychological test. There were three separate batteries. You had to talk to a psychiatrist in person. There was like a 700-question test. And, and then there was another psychological test. Um, so if you pass that, and the physical and all the other requirements in the background investigation, hey, I dub you once, I dub you twice, I dub you thrice, a certain night to you, you're now a police officer. But how do you determine if that person, that person can truly be empathetic to a community that it fears, doesn't know, and never had an, um, any type of social um, interaction on the positive side with, with, with the community doesn't like? So my answer to your question in a roundabout way would be, 
is to figure out a way how we as a society can screen people in law enforcement. And, and oftentimes, if you do have deep-seated, deep-rooted biases and prejudice, it's going to surface up. As a detective in an internal investigation division, we could have an officer formally charged, let's say, a dozen times, and they were exonerated or found not guilty or it was unfounded. Well, we look at that as, hmm, where's the smoke, there's fire. Just because we could not find credible evidence that supported their formal complaint does not mean that it did not happen. So we would try to take a second look at officers, even though they were exonerated or the complaint was unfounded or found not guilty, to take a second look. So I would like to see that type of um, process in place to say, wait a minute, something doesn't look quite right here. Um, yeah, and, and, with, and, with the and with the training that we would get, I often hear this. This is one of the things that really um, is a burr under my saddle. Whenever I hear a solution would be, hey, let's just train the officers. Let's give them community policing, training, experience. Let, and let me tell you something. Every officer that graduates from the police academy across the United States just because we can memorize and regurgitate that information doesn't mean that you're going to apply it. So believe you me, police officers are trained right now as we speak to be mindful, to be kind, to be um, empathetic, sympathetic, and not to have deep rooted biases. We're trained like that. So this this new wave of thinking of let's just retrain them and have them think of no, you got it's done. An officer, you can have someone with deep rooted biases and prejudices. They can pass every test given. And that includes how to how to um, how to show up trust between community and police. There's questions about that too. How do you do that? And we do um, practicums about that. How you interact with the community. And, and and officers can pass that. But what happens when you get out on the street when you've been when you have graduated and you've been given that power? How you really, really, really feel is gonna come out. So that's so that's where we are. So uh, so you um, you're saying, if I could kind of try to summarize, that uh, first of all, uh, blacks are not immune uh, from racism. Uh, second of all, that there are countless uh, tests uh, and screening procedures uh, that police departments use. Um, and in addition, you, sort of, you anticipated and, and, and partly answered my next question, and there are training programs um, that attempt to mold people to be more uh, broad-minded uh, and maybe gentler uh, but your contention, if I'm hearing you right, is these uh, these screening procedures uh, aren't are not effective. We don't have we haven't had uh, a way of really anticipating. Uh, people can kind of bluff their way through these things, or maybe they're not even so aware themselves. Uh, these are deep deep seated biases, after all. Um, uh, so essentially, then you you move further and and are saying that um, some, but on the basis of people's actions, if they, if they repeatedly uh, behave in a racist fashion, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Um, and so you are kind of moving to uh, the matter that even when someone has, the, has a record of, of repeated uh, misbehavior, uh, that not, not nearly enough uh, is done about it. Would that be a, a fair summary? Uh, yeah. And Yes, exactly. And thank you for that summary. And I will also include that part of the background investigation for police officers is to check to see if you belong to any subversive type of organizations. So you can be cleared of all that. Are you going to come forth and say, oh, yes, I do. I, I believe in overthrowing the government. So um, I think a little bit more emphasis needs to be done because what's going on today um, as we speak with what's happening in our nation's capital, now they are looking at those National Guards to make sure they do not belong right, right. to any subversive type of um, organization. So 
uh, I think this might be the tipping point for that to be a major component in the process of um, of, um, of screening people who are going to ha- who are going to end up with a lot of authority, with a lot of power. And I always say A plus B equals C. Power, authority plus prejudice equals <laughs> unfavorable outcomes. Well, for surely we know uh, that, for example, people people who are who work for the public, let's say, as teachers uh, or healthcare workers or whatever, uh, that if they had a record of five, six, seven, ten uh, abusive in- incidents uh, with the public, uh, they'd be out on their ear. So you're absolutely the notion, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, that people who are given uh, literally the power of life over death, or torture or harassment over the public, uh, could have uh, a sloppy record and, and still persist in their jobs is it's sc- a scandal. There's no doubt. Uh, let yeah. me let me move to a, a slightly different focus here. Um, uh, another uh, strategy that uh, after Mac- Michael Brown's death in Ferguson in 2014, now this is over six years ago, body cameras were touted as as a tool to increase accountability. Uh, yet we find uh, that the videos that capture abuse are far more far more likely to have been filmed by bystanders than perpetrators. What's going on here, Detective Ramsey? Um, That is a good example of uh, marketing and um, of um, private entities getting contracts with law enforcement agencies that are in the telecommunications field. So if I were in the, um, if I own a telecommunications type of um, business where we make body cameras, I'm going to do the best song and dance, tap dance that you ever want to see to convince the powers that be that this is going to help with community relationships. Again, it goes back to the individual officer. They've been trained to use that equipment. They've been told if you if you turn it off, there are going to be repercussions. They have been giving all of this and they have passed every test and they have, they have worked with that. There's not one piece of equipment that any law enforcement officer is issued without first being trained on that. It doesn't matter whether it is your handgun or whether it is your camera or how to how to properly wear your uniform. We get training in everything from head to toe, every equipment. So, okay, let's say you give me that camera and I have passed. I know how to use it. Uh, I know how to abuse it because in order to use something, you figure out how you're going to abuse it. So again, that officer knows what kind of officer that they are. Some officers will look at that piece of equipment as well. This is going to showcase how well I am as an officer relating to a community. I embrace this. Let's say you're an officer that said, "Mm, Man, this is going to be my Achilles heel. This is going to show me because I can't unscramble the eggs of me being that officer that has deep rooted biases and prejudice. So now I see this as something to catch me. I don't see this as something that's going to help me stay safe. I don't see this as something that's going to help with community trust. I don't see this as that. I see this as you're trying to get me. You're trying to catch me. So when we go to roll call and that sergeant, that supervisor go by you and you got your all your weaponry on you and you got your camera on and your camera's working fully and it's fully charged and your radio's charged, your computer and laptop is charged and everything is charged and you're charged up. And the first thing you do, you get in your car, click, you turn that camera off. You turn it off. And then on top of that, here in Baltimore, we have something called Police Officer Bill of Rights. Um, I think Baltimore, might, the state of Maryland might have been the first state in the United States that offered police officer bill of rights. And what that means is that you have a layer of protection. It's almost like an insurance policy. The certain thing that you do, you don't have to say you're sorry, you don't have to apologize, anything like that, um, because it's a liability issue. So you have a shield around the shield around the shield. 
So even if you that officer that turned that camera off, knowing full well you're in violation, but it's just a minor violation. It's not a criminal act. And let's say, oh, I can take that. It's almost like the equivalent I said to like speeding when you're driving in your car. And you say, well, the tick, if I get a ticket, it's only a couple hundred dollars. I can deal with it. I can handle that. Not a problem. And you continue to speed because every time you get a speeding ticket, you're only going to be charged a couple hundred dollars. And, you know, you get an attorney, make sure you made any points and your insurance doesn't go up. So it all depends upon what you can deal with. So if you're that officer that knows that you're not going to use this tool to help you and the community show up a positive relationship and you turn off, the worst is going to happen is slap on the wrist. Uh, could, could I ask a, just a, an additional question? I don't know how common this is, but I had been reading, for example, in Chicago, um, there's some problem in getting the footage released, uh, that if they do have a camera on, um, as you say, there's, what did you say, a shield within a shield, uh, so that the, the police are the ones that actually get the footage, not the public, uh, and then they can decide uh, whether they'll release it or when they'll release it or possibly, I don't know, they might doctor it. I, I, could you comment on that? I, I don't know a lot about it. Yeah, as a detective and work with internal investigation, but there are internal components that are that are in play. So um, like I said, the shield within the shield, uh, there are certain things police officers can admit to, cannot admit to, because they are protected with what we call our police officer uh, bill of rights. And so they are fully aware of that, that they have protection on top of protection. And I do recall that when I was investigating police officers, that if an officer was found not guilty or they were exonerated or the complaint was unfounded, then that is not public record. The only time it becomes public record, if that officer was found guilty, and then that becomes public record. So you might want to get into every jurisdiction is different. So I'm just speaking of what happened in Baltimore. I'm not really sure if that still is in effect, but that's those were the guidelines that I operated under. And another thing I found very um, interesting, and way too often, um, citizens filing complaints against police officers. And I will always ask them, I said, okay, um, I, I've taken down your report. I said, what is it that you would like to have done? I will always ask. I said, what would you like? And majority of the time, you know what people would say? I just want the officer to say they were sorry. I don't want to sue anybody. I don't want to take any more further action because I have a job and I don't have that kind of time. I can't afford an attorney. But I felt like I was so wrong and so disrespected. If that officer could just say, hey, I'm sorry. And you know what I would have to say to that complainant? We can't do that. If the officer said they're sorry, that's an admission of guilt. That's a liability issue. And that comes under the police officer bill of rights. So I would like to see something like that could be changed because we would have not had many, so many complaints. And look at the community trust. If that officer was not, um, his hands or, or her hands were not tied, to, if they would say, look, miss, I'm sorry, but you know, the dispatcher gave me a description of this vehicle uh, going down North and Pennsylvania Avenue, and it was red, and it was, they had these people just robbed the bank in a red car going eastbound on North Avenue. You in a red car going eastbound? So I'm often, and I'm so sorry I stopped you, but that's what that's why I stopped you, and I didn't have time to explain it to you because I got another call. So I can see how you felt. Hey, because you didn't hear the dispatcher, you didn't know a bank was just robbed, you didn't know that someone just hauled off in a red car. And so oftentimes, if we had the opportunity to have the officer and the complainant, the citizen come together so they can clear the air and have a better understanding and have a better relationship, it would solve a lot of, um, a lot of problems. So it, it goes back to police officers um, hand tied with legal liability issues that they do not want to subject themselves because they've been told, you can't say you're sorry because it could come back and use against you. But if we were had some kind of um, mechanism in play where this is what was done, this is how we resolved it, and that complainant cannot come back and say, I'm using this against the officer because they admitted they did something wrong. So uh, it wouldn't take a legal eagle to come up with something as simple as that for the sake of community trust and better understanding and clearing the air and for the sake of clarity. It's simple. 
to me, the wind right now well, is well. <laughs> Well, it, it's, it, I, I don't know that I want to move the discussion in the direction of, of why it's not simple, uh, but, but it's certainly often the case that many of us feel that, uh, that some straight, there's a straightforward solution, Let's, but, the, but the barriers in terms of power uh, are, are great. And that, that sort of brings me uh, to, my, to my next question, because I think barriers of power is kind of the answer. Uh, my next question yeah. is, uh, perhaps the oldest attempt to control police misconduct, at least uh, for baby boomers, is civilian review boards. I remember when John Lindsay established a civilian review, review board in New York in 1966. Today, about 200 cities have local police oversight boards of one kind or another. But those cities don't seem to have any less police violence than cities that have no such boards. What's the problem there? Well, I just have my own personal, um, I guess, theory and direct knowledge about um, civilian review boards. And I can only speak to my experience here in Baltimore. Hmm. And uh, we did work with civilian review boards. Uh, my experience with that body of people oftentimes they would be just that citizen. So some things look really good on paper and, and application is something totally different. And what would happen, we would have citizens from the community that just didn't, who just not aware of the inner workings of how the police department work, what a general order state, you know, police officer bill of rights, you know, something as simple as, you know, we cannot get them to say, I'm sorry, um, it's a liability issue. So oftentimes what I saw was that citizens would defer to the police um, summary of what happened and determination. So, I mean, think about this. I'm a detective. I am investigating a fellow officer. Uh, that in itself should raise eyebrows. Uh, and you want to be as objective as humanly possible that you can be. How many times have would an officer investigate another officer and they may have like some type of personal or some type of relationship with them. Even if it's not direct, oh, I know your people or I know the side of town you're from or I went to the same school. There's always something relatable that um, we as human beings fall back on that can, you know, um, cloudy up our objectiveness and just being a human being. So to answer your question, um, Civilian review boards are comprised of civilians and law enforcement officers. So law enforcement officers will have the edge over how the outcome may end up. And so the citizen will defer to them because they have pretty much convinced them that they have more knowledge than they do. And so they will succumb to the finalization of what, what that particular investigation is going to look like. Well, I wonder if that's going to be your answer to my next question. Um, I got to throw it at you anyway. When, lo when local oversight fails, the next step can be federal intervention. For many years, but especially under Obama, when systemic police misconduct is alleged, the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice can investigate. And if they find a pattern or practice of policing that violates the Constitution, they can demand reforms. A timetable of changes is developed and a resulting consent degree is overseen by a federal judge and, at least supposedly, an independent monitoring team. I understand that Baltimore has been under consent degree. Is your sense that patterns or practice agreements are of any use, or are they going to land us where civilian review boards have landed us? Well, a, that's a fantastic question, and I want to answer that in, um, on, on two platforms, one as a citizen and one as a former police officer. As a citizen, for the federal government to come in, and Boston, you're right, Baltimore is currently under a federal consent decree, and what that means as a citizen to me, hey, hey, you guys, 
have not been treating the community right. And there's enough physical evidence to back that up. So the citizen, I say, wow, thank goodness, here comes the cavalry and they're going to clear it up on one level. <laughs> However, since I have some inner working, so the federal, that, and then again, as a citizen, that really does not satisfy me to the degree of feeling hopeful that we're going to be able to patch things up. It just delays the process. So for the federal government to come in and say, hey, you're not treating the citizens right. As a citizen, Hello, we raise our hands. We've been saying that to you all for eons, for decades. So why are you um, accepting the federal government to say, hey, you're not treating the citizens fairly? We've been saying that. Why haven't you been listening to us? So it's not very beneficial as a citizen for a consent decree. Again, something, sometimes things look fantastic on paper, but an application, is it really helping? So if you... For me, as a citizen, if you ask me, is that consent decree making the relationship better? No, because under consent decree, we've had officers go off to federal court, found guilty under a federal consent decree. So what good is that doing to the average citizen? Um, so it, it, it all comes down to a federal consent decree could have been avoided. Had the power that be listened to the people to say, we have a problem. And it's a real problem. You were also going to, you, when you began, you said, uh, I want to tell you what a consent degree means to a citizen. Uh, and then now, uh, could you tell us what it means to a police officer? Yeah, as a police officer, oh, I've watch my keys. <laughs> I can lose my job. As a police officer, it's like, oh my gosh, I can get over on my immediate supervisor, on my sergeant, my lieutenant, on my colonel, on my major. Uh, I can I can skirt I can dance around them, but the federal government coming in, oh my gosh, that might that may have some of the police officers tighten up a little bit, just a little bit, but um, it's a heavy handness that the police officers may interpret as, you know, um, this is a level another level that I need to figure out how I can get around. Whoa. <laughs> Not too optimistic, I'm afraid. Of course, what, what you're telling us, you know, Detective Ramsey, really just reinforces what we already know, because as I pointed out, it, it's been 30 years, and it's, it's not like things haven't been attempted. These many things have been attempted, and people have been, been concerned, uh, and we have not really overcome the problem, um, and it, it, it doesn't sound like the direction we're going uh, is is going to change things uh, further. Um, why don't we move now? We have our, our viewers haven't perhaps seen them, but we have two guests with us, two concerned citizens uh, who would like to uh, to also ask our guest a question. Uh, the first is Patricia Nelson, uh, outgoing president of Concerned Citizens. Pat, uh, what would you like to ask Detective Ramsey? Yes, I've been very interested in what you've been saying. Uh, but today, there's been a lot of criticism over the idea of um, defunding the police. And um, I'm not sure that people understand what, what that means. And I wonder if you would support it, if it uh, would by your definition of what defund the police means. Yeah, um, for me, um... And again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from two different um, areas in my mind. And whenever I hear defund the police, I take it upon myself to interpret that, to translate that, what it really means. And for me, what it really, really means is to refund the community. When our budget goes up for review uh, with our um, Baltimore City Council, I think the last time it went up, it... Uh, I think we have a budget of like a half a billion dollars just for our police department. And that's a lot of money when you look at a city that's the size. Maybe we have like 600,000 citizens. At one time, Baltimore had like over a million. But when you look at the population of Baltimore, even though, yes, on paper, we have 600,000 plus citizens. But anyone coming into Baltimore and may need to call upon 911, well, they are privy to that. We don't say, well, are, are you a resident? So on any given day, we might have 600,000 
citizens, but we may have another 100,000 people working in Baltimore or who are visiting Baltimore. So on any given day, we might have a million people literally inside of Baltimore City. And if anything happens where any one of those millions of people need to call 911, well, now we have to tax the department that is um, not equipped to handle that type of volume. And I always say to people, if, and when I was a patrol officer, I did the math. I, it, I One day I did the math. We had like, at that time, we had like 3,000 Baltimore City police officers. And I said, well, let's divide it by on three different shifts, because we had three different shifts. So on any given shift, eight-hour shift, there's 1,000 officers. Okay, we have 10 districts, including headquarters. So we have on any given day, on any given eight-hour shift, 1,000 officers divided by 10 districts, that's 100 officers per district. So out of the 100 officers per district, <laughs> they, some are on vacation, some are on sick leave, some are on administrative leave, some have, you know, retired. So on any given day, out of those 10 locations, you might actually just have 30 officers in uniform hitting the streets for a million people. So I would say to people, if y'all would do the math, <laughs> And so I did the math and it came out to me, my post, I had like 10,000 people that I was responsible for. And I said, that was really frightening to think that one person would be responsible to, um, to assist over 10,000 people. And that was just a foot post. That wasn't even like a regular um, carpet. So I'm just saying that I look at that as not defund the police, but refund the community because if we can take a portion if we just took 1% of that and put it towards um, uh, quality of life services uh, for the community, that would mean a lot. So it's a matter of just shifting the money around, not taking anything away from the police department and just throw it out the window or, 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 or not use it. And so I interpret that as refund the community, take some of that money out the budget to go towards um, community organizations, nonprofits who are doing things, grassroots organizations who are doing things to enhance the quality of life for communities. And so that's how I see it. Because when you say defund the police, okay, let's say that becomes a reality. Let's say the police departments are defunded and some of the money from the budget has to be taken. What are you gonna do with that money? You're gonna reallocate it, correct? So aren't we just saying, refund the community well so, of course uh, it's possible someone might say well we could have a tax cut whatever you can use it whichever way you want to but it's just a matter of taking those real dollars and putting it to real programs that are that will be helping the quality of life for for a community that is in just and I know for Baltimore is in desperate need. Even though I was a police officer here in Baltimore, I, I still live in Baltimore City. I'm a resident of Baltimore City. I love Baltimore City. It's a beautiful place. And there's no other place I would rather be than right here in Baltimore. I, I have deep reach right here in Baltimore. I feel like, hey, I am Baltimore. <laughs> I, I believe it. I think that's, that's a wonderful <laughs> statement. And I think Baltimore is delighted to hear you say that. Uh, Wendy Burry, uh, you also have a question, please, for our speaker. Can I, excuse me, can I follow up on uh, Pat's question just for a minute? Uh, in my mind, we, we ask the police to do so many different kinds of tasks. It's not, you know, <clears throat> doing things like trying to settle domestic disputes and things of that sort. Uh, in my mind, defund the police meant bringing in, uh, instead of automatically sending police out to some of these situations that calls come in for, that we find other government agencies who are uh, better equipped and better trained to handle uh, some of the things that we ha ask the police to do now. So is that correct or not? Absolutely. You are a woman after my own heart. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And a good example would be like um, an emergency um, petition where here in Baltimore, if you feel like someone is a danger to themselves or to others, they may hurt themselves, they may hurt others, like in, a, in, in an imminent situation. That um, I have gone on countless calls like that. Was I equipped like that for a mental health situation? Absolutely not. So I just would um, depend upon my um, humanitarian um 
uh, qualities to try to reach that person. And I'll give you a good example. I had a call where this woman, she had just was not taking her medication and she was in a really, really bad place mentally. And she had barricaded herself in her home and she had um, a fire, a fire weapon. And I was called on the scene because it was a woman and they felt that I could talk with her. And I did. And um, my voice, as opposed to a man's voice, to try to help her to try to see that we're there to help her. And that we're not there to hurt her, even though she is possess posing a direct and imminent threat to us. So I actually had to talk to her for like over half an hour, I do believe. Mm -hmm. And as I'm talking with her, I'm entering her home. Now, I don't know the floor plan. So she, again, she has me at, at um, I'm at a disadvantage. She knows her floor plan. I don't. I know there's a person there in distress and they have a deadly weapon that could that could hurt herself or could hurt me. Mm -hmm. But I was not trained to deal with that. So again, like I said, I was just, um, depend, I'm relying upon um, as a woman, as a mother, as a humanitarian, as someone sympathizing with her. And I appreciated my um, fellow officers calling me to the scene as opposed to them trying to handle. So long story end is that it had a wonderful ending. I was able to talk her to put her um, handgun down and let's just take it from there. Wow. And she, yeah, so she was able to do, but I had no training with that. <laughs> I had, and my son never knew that story. At that time, I think my son was turning. Like I would have, if I had told my son <laughs> that I was in a situation where I was talking someone down from to putting down a deadly weapon that could have used against his mom, you know, so there was a lot of things things that went into that whole experience, but it had a happy ending, but I wasn't trained. Right. So we all like to see money, or what you were just saying, to be diverted to mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. When we call, like, yes, the officer can be there in case things go really, really bad and, and medical attention is needed and we can have um, the medical unit there. Now, you know, there was a time I lived in Durham and they had something where the fire department and the police department were under the same roof. They were one. So if the fire department got a call, the police would go out with them. If the police had a call, the fire um, engine would go out with them also because they had medics there. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would like to see a convergence of those two type of agencies, um, which type of agencies working together simultaneously. And then it opens up, it opens up an opportunity for, um, um, for other job opportunities and career opportunities. So wouldn't it be fantastic if we had young people trained to work in those type of positions? So we, we're opening up a whole new um, whole new career path for young people. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think it's time for us to stop looking at police officers as the um, as the all in all. I have had on occasion, on one moment, um, I'm going to... Uh, school crosswalk because the um, crossing guard did not show up <laughs> and I had kids across the street and the very next call was a homicide. So <laughs> everything in between, you know, from traffic, um, control, all of that. So instead of us being um, what I call, when I was on the street, I call myself a general practitioner. And when I became a detective, I referred to myself, well, now I'm a specialist. <laughs> I can <laughs> zoom in on, <laughs> on what type of, um, uh, uh, you know, what I was doing. So yeah, I think we need to get away. It's old school. I really do believe that officers cannot just handle it's, it's too much. The outnumber don't have the um the training and the qualification. And it's just um, I think we have to have a whole new model. I think we have to have a whole new thing and not call it policing anymore, but call it peace officers or something. So I, I think we have to it's like baking a cake and you put in bad eggs. And you know it's gonna, it's not gonna be good, but you keep putting this icing on top of it, thinking that it's gonna be okay. Or maybe put some candles on it and write some really nice, pretty words on it. But no, the cake is still rancid. It has some bad eggs in it. So I, I think it's time for a new recipe. Oh, thank you, uh, Sue. Do I have I'm, time to? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm afraid. Essentially, we we are about out of time at, at this point. Uh, I, I think the, the uh, little metaphor about the cake, uh, it will be hard for us to top that. that that's really, really just excellent. Uh, 
um, a kind of analogy of, of what the problem is that that essentially what Detective Ramsey is telling us is that uh, that there are uh, uh, all kinds of toppings that that look look very tasty and appealing, but somehow down there in the center we haven't we haven't attacked the core problem. Yes. Well, uh, people, this has been a very informative discussion. Uh, concerned citizens, thanks Detective Ramsey for taking the time to speak with us today, and we thank. Uh, the audience for taking the time to watch this excellent program. And we thank the Law Enforcement Action Partnership for referring us to Detective Ramsey. As long as the lockdown persists, Concerned Citizens Presents will offer discussions, lectures, and interviews on timely issues. Please join us again soon.